I'm August Hunnicky. This is the second edition of Tree Talk. There are three basic things that make an accomplished arborist or tree man, in my opinion. The first would be passion, a hunger for the work, climbing trees, the gear, etc. The second would be a natural aptitude. Uh, the guy is or girl is naturally gifted at climbing, uh, physically fit, and you don't have to have both of those things. Passion will take you a long ways. Uh, natural aptitude obviously will take you a long ways even if you're just doing it for the money. However, the third thing I believe is critically important and that would be a good teacher, a good source of instruction. So for me, my initial history into the industry was fraught with a lot of pain, a lot of injury, when I started, I had a natural aptitude for it. I was good at climbing. I had a lot of passion. I had a little too much bravery. I think it would be more important uh, personality trait to have would be caution. Bravery will definitely uh, get you some experience. But for me, by the time 1995 rolled around, I had so many lost hours, uh, lost days, lost months from injuries got familiar with the inside of an ambulance. Uh, in 1995 I fell over 40 feet and had life-changing uh, injuries not only to my body but also in a good way to my ego. And it was after that that I really began to seek instruction and I went up uh, even farther north started working with Scott Parr in Silverdale, Washington, a great climber, very knowledgeable, and some of his uh, climbers and cutters. But really, my greatest uh, source of instruction I found in the form of a book. This book right here I bought at a jamboree in, I think it was Eugene, Oregon, in probably 1998. And it was then that I really began to add some understanding to the how and why of tree work. And so it is really a bucket list event for me, a great milestone in my career to interview Jerry Baronic today, who is basically uh, my Mr. Miyagi, uh, Yoda, whatever you want to call it. He is the guy who I think is responsible for saving a lot of lives just by taking the time to document and teach. There's a lot of great skill out there but not a lot of great teachers. Jerry Baronic is not only a great skilled sawyer, climber, cutter, but a very gifted teacher and writer. And so it is my pleasure today to introduce to you Jerry Baronic and I encourage you to find out what he's written and get your hands on some of his work, perhaps all of it like I have, and it'll really flesh out or bring your, your experience, your instruction, your knowledge to a great and high level. Okay, so without further ado, we are here with Jerry Baronic and his lovely wife Terry Baronic and we thought we'd get it started off with simple stuff so a brief explanation if you could of your occupation. Well, I'm a retired arbor arborist uh, but primarily uh, uh, tree work industry related professionally started out in line clearance tree work but it really wasn't the start of my career really I started climbing poles in the service in line distribution team in Vietnam. I see so so is it because of climbing poles in Vietnam that you kind of knew what you wanted to do later? I had planned to go into machine work when I was discharged from the service and uh, applied for uh, 
uh, a veterans uh, apprenticeship program with a machining company in Santa Rosa, California. I mean, REITs manufacturing it was. And they, and they said they would accept my application, but they didn't have an opening at the time and would give a call when uh, they had it. So I, it was set. I was going to go into machining, was going to be my career. But in the meantime, I didn't have a, a telephone, and so uh, my mother took the call. And uh, so several weeks later, it passed. And she says, oh, you know, Jerry, I forgot to tell you, you got a call from Reed's. <laughs> forgot Reed to tell you, you had a job. <laughs> so I went, I went down to uh, the plant and uh, told them what happened. They said, oh, your position got filled and it would probably be a two or three years before we get a, another opening and mm -hmm. another slot for a vet. And Praise the Lord. <laughs> so a friend of mine was do, working for a line clearance tree company in Santa Rosa called Sonar, there's a Sonar Tree Service. And he told me, he says, Jerry, since you know how to climb poles, you could probably get a job at the tree service I'm working for. Hmm. Uh, but it was Bob Standish, the old high school chum. And so I went down there uh, to the yard and met the supervisor. And he says, yeah, you know, he says, can you, uh, see? he said, I understand you, you know the basics about climbing. And he says, that's good because we need, we need, we got a slot open for somebody that, uh, for on a climbing crew. Well, I didn't know a darn thing about uh, trees or climbing with ropes. I could, all I knew how to do was put on a set of spurs and a buck strap. And Hold on right there. Tell them about the first time you put on spurs. Oh, uh, well, on that, on that line distribution team I was uh, with in Vietnam, uh, 589th Engineer Group, I was running a line truck and I was the line truck operator. I would set the poles in the ground and uh, dig the holes and set the poles mm -hmm. and the linemen would climb the poles, set the cross arms and string the wire and we'd just go down and build all this plant through our, uh, through the compound. Well, one day I told them I wanted to try to climb a pole. Well, because they were standing around asking, you know, everybody was looking up at this pole wondering who was going to climb and set the guy <laughs> wire in it. And I said, hey, let me do it. You know, I said, I haven't climbed the pole yet, you know, and I said, that looks really cool, I think they want to do it. <laughs> so, they, really, the fact is, none of them wanted to do it because it wasn't, it didn't have a guy wire on it, it was fresh tamped pole, uh -huh. wobble like this. So it was a double lot, 65 footer, I'll never forget it. So I put the spurs on, got on my belt, put the buck strap around the pole, and took my first step and it, my spur didn't catch, and I nearly hit my ram my head right into the pole, and they all laughed, and so I, uh, I got my composure back, and I did it again. I took that step, and the spur didn't engage, and I nearly ran my head into the pole again. I go, and I looked down, and I put my spurs on back. <laughs> the spurs were pointing out. This, this is Jerry Baronic. It's a classic ladies mistake. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it, it was a classic mistake, and they were all laughing at me. None of them was going to be telling me what. Or they watched me put oh, the yeah. spurs on backwards, but they sure. never said a thing. So uh, it was a it was a, a moment of humility there, and uh, I put the spurs on right, and mm -hmm. I. First step, they stuck right in the pole. I go, and I hoisted myself up on that one. They were better like this. They go, hey, they, they stuck. And I took a couple of steps up, and they stuck. And I go, oh, no, no fear about gaffing out and falling, or, you know, there was, you know, I, I had to go. So I started hiking up. I had the guy wire um, uh, hooked to my belt and uh, started hiking up the pole. I got about, I guess, about halfway up, and it was started wobbling because it wasn't. It was a fresh tamp pole, and uh, uh, there was no guy wire in it. The whole firm. And so I stopped and, and looked down, and I was about 30 feet up, and I could see the crew on the ground looking up at me, and I'm looking down at them, and I looked up at the top of that pole, and it looked farther away than it did when I was on the ground. <laughs> I'm going, oh, wait a second here. 
talk about fear and nervous tension, mm -hmm. you know. And they weren't saying a thing. They were you from the ground. It's and in I, the book, Fear and Nervous Tension. Look it up, chapter one. It's without a uh, word being said. I looked up there and I said, I'm going to set this guy wire on this pole. I'm going to do it. And I, I from there, I went to the top without stopping. And, and the rest is history. Yeah. When I came down, they, they had, they had I, I set the guy on the hook and they, they uh, tightened it up and the pole came firm and I hiked down on the spurs. I never gaffed out, I never kicked out. Uh, it was all, it all went pretty smooth as far as the climbing part went. You know, if you took a video of it, you'd say, well, that guy knows what he's doing. Hmm. You know, but you know that was the first time I had ever climbed the pole, and, and they all yeah. the the team came around and congratulated me. Said, "Jerry, we went to school for six months to learn how what you just did in ten minutes," <laughs> and uh, and I liked it. I enjoyed it. So I gave I gave the job of the line truck to someone else, and I started doing pole line construction for the for the service. Yeah, in Vietnam. So, since I interrupted you to tell that story. Go back that's, to that's how I got into trimming trees, doing line clearance work, mm -hmm. and I loved it. Of course, I could have climbed those trees with without a, a rope back then. I, I was only uh, 19 years old. I was discharged out of the service at 19, full time. Mm -hmm. So I went in when I was 17. Mm -hmm. And no fear. Uh, I had to learn how to climb trees, though. They weren't poles. They weren't a vertical shaft. Mm -hmm. uh, they were all different, different types of bark and uh, different sizes and different characters and and I had to learn how to uh, move through them. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just vertical up and down, it was horizontal and getting out on limbs and, and setting ropes and figuring out how, how I'm going to do this. So on that subject, did you have anyone teaching you? I mean, did you have any role models for tree work? Like for me, this book here, this basically was my role model. So I'm wondering if you had any role models. Well, having having started totally green in the trees, uh, everybody everybody there was far smarter than me in, in mm -hmm. as far as uh, trade knowledge goes. All the tricks. So you didn't have like one. Mr. Miyagi not, type guy that stands out. For not you. right off the bat. It took mm -hmm. it took me a, a a couple of years to sort out who really knew what they uh, were doing, who who could talk the talk and walk the walk. Some mm -hmm. could talk a good tree man, mm -hmm. but they they weren't. Some of them weren't as good a tree man as I thought they were when I first met them. Right. And and within. About five years, I knew who the real tree man and was. And it was you. No, <laughs> by far. I I tried to emulate uh, uh, one of them, probably the, the one that was the smartest one in the Santa Rosa district for the Sonar Tree Service in 1969 was a fellow named Jim Rudell. He was he was an oak man, as Don Blair would call it. Right. You have your oak man and you got your oak man. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim Rudell was, was an oak man. True oak man. Uh, he had a lot of pride and uh, taught me how taught me uh, spurless climbing, uh, more rope technique. He was better at explaining how to do something. Uh, he was good about that. Some of the most of the foremen I worked for lacked uh, dearly in in, in the instructive quality and how to explain. They right. could do they could do it, but they couldn't explain it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were. Uh, through in frustration, be, were uh, uh, would be angry, you know, saying, "Well, how come you can't figure it out on your on your own?" Right. You know, I'm going, "Well, because I've never done this before." How come you're such a crappy teacher? <laughs> I couldn't say that. No, of course not. <laughs> so, tell me just a little bit about. I don't have to go into tons of detail, but a little bit of childhood history. What's it like to be growing up, Jerry Baronic? Uh, born and raised on the north coast uh, of California, uh, family totally uh, timber re uh, industry related. Uh, my stepfather worked in the mills, my grandfather uh, was a heavy equipment mechanic uh, in the woods. Uh, my uncles 
drove log truck and lumber truck. We moved around. Uh, uh, there was uh, lots of uh, uh, work wasn't steady. Mills would mm -hmm. shut down and we'd have to move to um, other towns that had mills that were working or there would be layoffs. And my, I never even graduated school. And before I, I quit my junior year, I went to over 35 different schools. And it was tough as a kid growing up and going to that many schools because every time you're the new kid in the school, the bullies like to find out how tough the new guy is. Hmm. And, uh, and in a way that made me tough because uh, and at first I used to bow down to them and, and, and be the, the weenie, you know, bow down to the bullies. But after a while, after so many years of it, I started swinging. And, mm -hmm. and I gained some respect too because the bullies would go around and tell the other people, don't mess with the new kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the new kid uh, ended up, whatever, you, whatever happened during that time definitely created some character for a standout career. I have a couple questions here from the Treehouse. Treehouse is an internet forum where guys like us hang out and chit chat. And this question is from Randy Morissette. And he would like to know what you think is the most common mistake that climbers make. As a newbie or, or just in general? Just in general, like he has two questions. One is what's the most common mistake that you think is made by climbers in general? And then uh, the other one is what do you think is the most dangerous mistake that people make? Uh, well, I, I think the biggest mistake all climbers are inclined to make is to become complacent uh, on the job. Uh, the routine uh, comes Routine. Every job is different, and it's you know, I I found myself uh, not doing in the beginning, not doing a, a thorough evaluation of, of jobs and taking them on, and then coming back and getting on the back side of the tree. I only looked at from one side and finding something that totally changed the picture, and mm -hmm. and real made me realize that I can't do it for what I just what I told them for, you know, right. and. Uh, that was a big mistake. Yeah, well, I was, you know, I just looked at the tree from one side. That's the com most common uh, mistake uh, I think that climbers make, tree men in general uh, do, is to become complacent. Now, as far as dangerous mistakes go, uh, like a common dangerous. I think Randy's wondering what is the most common dangerous mistake that this day and age. I found myself uh, in a, before I retired uh, working around uh, ground crews that are, are too busy uh, to worry about what's going on above them is uh, you know entering the, entering the work zone, the drop zone without telling a climber where, what they're doing and leaving your rope on the ground and having a drag to a chipper. Mm. Uh, I, I can't say how many times I looked down and seen the ground crew come in, pick up some brush or, or, or winch, winch, set a winch line on a top or something and, and drag it to the chipper with my rope tangled in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after that, I started coiling up the rope and keeping it up with me. So and thank you, uh, Randy Morissette, for that. We have another what, question. What's his screen name? Randy's. NH Local. Oh, okay. NH Local. Thank you. <laughs> okay, the next question is from uh, Mick Dempsey. Is he in France? Mm -hmm. is he? Yes. He or is. Said yes. I believe yeah. so. His name on the treehouse is Lobby Cause or something like that. Maybe I said it wrong. But he has an interesting question here. He says, with all the new gear and everything, um, are there certain skills that your contemporaries used that have fallen by the wayside now, but that all climbers should have a mastery of? Basic rope entry is, is uh, I got to say, that's a good question. And uh, because a lot of the new, new school climbers uh, today <clears throat> don't know basic rope entry. 
And if you gave them uh, just a bit, just a hank of rope to enter and move through a tree, a to hank, do a hank, up to a hundred feet of rope. Huh, I've never heard that term. Okay. If you give most so many, unfortunately, uh, new school climbers today, they're young, and they 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 picked up on all the new gear, latest techniques. If you gave them uh, a hank of rope to enter a tree, set up a climbing system with it, just no connectors, uh, no gadgetry, they wouldn't know how to do it. Hmm. And that's sad. That's sad. Yeah, there should be a foundation. There should yeah. be, you know. Yeah. I think I think all uh, all uh, people entering the trade should uh, get a uh, understanding of the root basics of mm -hmm. rope rope entry. Crude as it is, it'll bail you out when you have nothing else. It works. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks, Mick, for that. Uh, another question from the treehouse. Jed says or asks. <laughs> uh, he has a really long question, and I think I'll skip it for now because it's, uh, maybe we'll get back to it, Jed, but for now, let's go with the, the last part. Uh, does your tree guy celebrity make you uncomfortable? Your uh, status. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't like to be the, uh, I don't like being put up on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just a regular guy. Uh, the people that I work with know me as Jerry. And of course, when I go to the shows, people call me Mr. Baronic, mm -hmm. and uh, which I appreciate the uh, the formalities that, and the, uh, I understand that. But to uh, you know to list to hear their praise about my accomplishments and what I've done and stuff, it does make me uncomfortable. <laughs> I just like to be yeah. one of the one of the guys. <laughs> right. Well, thanks. That was a good question because. Uh, if you get any kind of notoriety at all, it, it can it can get awkward. So, not for some. Yeah, well, it should get awkward. <laughs> if you're not awkward with it, you need to reevaluate yourself. Okay, so this is a question that Nick Bonner asked Reg, and I liked it so much. And it is, what are you afraid of? Only time I've been nervous and afraid is when I was working with something that was uh, uh, marginally within my control. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 in a nutshell, bad trees. Mm -hmm. uh, no tie-ins, dead, bark slipping off, uh, worrying about rattling out some dead limbs or tops above you, uh, moving very slow, fear and nervous tension, Gripping, uh, never did like working in those situations. And, but if I had, I I've worked in in the wee tops of dead trees, but I've had double tie-ins to support me to where I can drop down on them and work them, mm -hmm. work them down that way. If anything broke out, I was above it. Right. You know, full confidence. I was working a dead tree one time, and uh, I got up to it, and it was so far gone that I, I couldn't cut anymore without fear of, of uh, hurting myself, maybe mm -hmm. killing myself. And uh, I came down and I told the property owner, he says, I can't finish this tree as it is. And so I said, uh, we'll have to either get a crane in here to drop somebody in from above, um, you know, to work it out. And I said, I can't do it. And I said, the only the other option is, is to fall it. He says, I can fall it and I can get it through there and cause minimum damage to your standing trees. And he says, well, go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. oh, man. <laughs> Is yeah. that easy? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, my favorite style of tree work right there. Uh, that whole top, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a piece bigger than a few inches uh, when it mm -hmm. hit the ground. And it was a big uh, top. Yeah. Breaking like breadsticks, huh? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about the books a little bit. The book that made Jerry famous to me is obviously the fundamentals of general tree work and I'd like to hear a little bit about how the book came to be what inspired you to go through the work and the cataloging and the photography I mean were you just gonna do that stuff anyway is that how Jerry is right out of the egg or or I mean what 
what goes right. what goes into the history of why this thing came to be? Well, when I was working with the Sonar Tree Service, August, uh, it, I moved to Fort Bragg and became a foreman with six years' experience. Six years' experience of foreman, mm -hmm. and I, of course, I thought I knew, I thought I knew it all. And they gave me a crew, and I had two green men working on it. So I had to teach them how to, you know, what I knew, so we could get some work done. It was all on-the-job training, and production work with on-the-job training that just does not mix. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I had a real, I was handicapped because I, uh, I was not that good at explaining how to do things back then. I knew mm -hmm. what I was doing, I could do them well, but get putting them in words to where people could understand it was very difficult for me. And, and if I remember right, the people who taught you didn't know how to... <laughs> yes, it was it's a wicked web. Okay. You know, it's just history uh, repeats itself. Mm -hmm. But you broke the chain, you broke the cycle. After training about 20 different people in five, four or five years, I, uh, because they'd come and go, it came to the point where I found myself repeating the same things over and over. Because mm -hmm. so much of the work is repetitious, uh, there's all different subtleties make it different, uh, but a lot of the things are basic and, and fundamental. And uh, I, I had an epiphany, and I said, I, I keep saying this over and over enough, I could write a book about it. <laughs> and, and right then I thought... So we wrote the book. So right then I thought, I'm going to write a book about this. But little did I know that... Uh, what it was going to take. Did you know that you were going to have the kind of epic content? No. At the time you started? The when, when I made, committed myself to do that book was in 1978 and it came to print in 1996. Okay, so take for example the, uh, the what's it? Newport? R New Rock Rockport. Rockport. The Rockport tree, the famous tree, 150 feet up. Uh, seven feet in diameter, top in this big redwood, epic tree work, uh, content for a, for a book. I mean, just really, really helped. At the time you started, none of that was on the was. No, um, but I was. Uh, I was already uh, uh, rigging trees in the woods for the loggers anyway. I'll tell you, yeah, uh, in all honesty, uh, regular arborist uh, tree work uh, is nothing like logging. It's, there's two parallels other than mm -hmm. uh, entering the trees to, uh, to set the rigging. It's, uh, you're working with a lot heavier stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the rigging was, would weigh hundreds of pounds, two or three hundred pounds. You need winches to get it up to you. No, there mm -hmm. wasn't people on the ground couldn't even pick it up. To, Right. Get it up to you. Big we're, skookum blocks and stuff. Yeah, we're rigging trees over 200 feet up, and it'd mm -hmm. still be six foot in diameter there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 the cables that it took to, to set and uh, the thought. Wait, well, now, I'll tell you, the, uh, I had an advantage over most uh, climbers that worked in the woods. Uh, they took those big trees on total old school with flip line and spurs. And they would cut the limbs off or pass the snaps over what limbs they would come up to on the way up. It would take them many hours, half a day sometimes, to rig a tree. I come from an arborist background, and I knew how to climb and traverse into the bigger trees from smaller ones. Mm -hmm. And they thought this was pretty novel because I could climb to the top of a Douglas fir that was only a 150 foot tall and swing over into a tree that's still six foot through at 160 feet and just step over into the big tree without killing myself getting up there. Right. And uh, <laughs> just send up the rigging boys. It was usually yeah. I'd have to set a pass block and that's it. Uh, it. A lot of people started picking up uh, on my style of entry uh, through Traverse uh, afterwards. Oh, yeah. but, it was it was brutal climbing those big trees with flip line and spurs. You, you talk at fifty foot flip lines, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and you're uh, bark this thick and rails of bark. You you know, uh, you couldn't get footing. You're kicking out, sliding down, and you're breathing redwood bark dust, old growth bark dust. Uh, it gave me uh, asthma. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got I woke up with the call uh, uh, redwood uh, lung. 
huh. from breathing the, it's almost like fiberglass fibers. Did you factor that into the cost of the book? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I didn't, I didn't realize what, uh, what it was until I seen uh, a number of old timers that, that had emphysema mm. and had asthma uh, from it. And they, it was all, uh, it was kind of like black lung in mm. with coal miners. Mm. Uh, a lot of the old, old school uh, timber fallers uh, were breathing uh, redwood bark dust uh, their whole career and ended up getting uh, emphysema from it. And mm. I've got it, I've got uh, um, a little bit of it, not as bad as they did, uh, but it's definitely well, because affected you, me. You climb the little trees first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's where this, this helps. Uh huh. So the book uh, got its beginnings uh, in '78, and it came to print in uh, 1996, I think. Yes, it debuted at Charlotte, North Carolina, TCI in 1996. Mm -hmm. It's uh, for me. It was the Bible of of tree work. It's Thank a you. solid, amazing uh, read. It so, was one of my best investments. Mm -hmm. How many copies sold? Uh, a little over 20,000. Mm -hmm. How many tree guys are there in the world? Millions. <laughs> we, need to, we need to get that book out. I'm telling you, I got the, I got the book. Uh, it probably saved my life because I had a, a pattern of, of getting injured every March. I know that's a weird thing to say, but I, I averaged one serious injury a year for a while, and it usually was in March. And, uh, and then I, I got this book and I just like saw so many things that I could do that would, wouldn't be as crazy as my style was at the time. So let's talk about another book. This book, the Coast Redwood book. Um, you can see, is this Terry on the cover? That's me. Yeah, you see Terry. Uh, showing the scale and the mass of these things. Terry was mentioning about a little bit of controversy around the redwoods and I have a friend who likes to climb redwoods and I won't say who his name is. Uh, well okay I'll just in a nutshell the Coast Redwoods is a compilation of all the redwood parks in California all thrown into one big ball of wax and from from the Oregon border all the way down to uh, Southern California, Big Sur, where the where the um, southern extent of the redwood goes. I've tried to, I've covered a lot in there, and amongst the many topics uh, about the redwood is one on recreational climbing, and I've uh, received a little bit of uh, criticism in there from some people about uh, about rec climbing uh, old growth redwoods, and which I was rick climbing old growth redwoods since the early 70s when I first started climbing trees. Uh, to me, it was never an issue. Nobody else was climbing at the time. Uh, you know, I couldn't even get anybody to climb giant redwood with me. Mm -hmm. But there I was, one on one with these huge trees in front of me and going up solo. And to me, I'll tell you what, when you get it, if you're by yourself, there's no one else around, and you spend three or four hours getting to the top of a 350 foot tall tree and you're the only one up there, you look around below you and all around you, all natural settings, it's like a religious experience. You hear that, Lawrence? Oh, I wasn't supposed to say your name. <laughs> it's true. And one of the things that uh, with the rec climbing community today, uh, they, they get into this big group climb things. Mm -hmm. And they want to do the, the redwood climbs, group climbs. You think a dozen people go up there, these trees. I'm, that rubs me a little bit wrong, the wrong way. I think it should be solo climbs, no more than two people at most. One person on the ground all the time, stand by for safety reasons. With modern day technology, they can communicate easily with the handheld talkies. Uh, the, the, ground, the ground man, it's important that there's somebody there in case something happens to the climber. But I think the rec climbing, the giant trees, should be solo experiences because when you get two or three if you get any more than three people up in a tree I'll tell you right now they start doing stupid things mm -hmm. it's 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 like the, a pack of dog mentality one one will behave himself you get two and they'll get a little rambunctious you get three dogs they'll start doing stupid things mm -hmm. 
Uh, and it's the same way when you start getting more than three people up in, up in a giant redwood tree. Mm -hmm. No, keep it down to the bare minimum. One. Should be. One-on-one -on -one ex experience. It's so the only way you can really appreciate it. Coast redwood, tree of dreams and fortune. There's obviously a lot more in the in the book than than uh, just a subject of wreck climbing, but it's there's a lot about the physiology and the life cycle of the redwood in here. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the parks and how big the trees are and stuff. It's about the physiology of the tree, the morphology of the tree, and uh, and its different habitats and 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 its uh, subspecies. There's. The old saying that if you've seen one redwood tree, you've seen them all. That's not true. It's interesting to me that Jerry, like, literally has a lung condition because of these things, and yet he's got this incredible labor of love gone into cataloging and talking about them at the same time. So you got credibility. Another book here. This is uh, probably the second most famous. High Climbers and Timber Fallers, loads of good storytelling and pictures in this book. And tell me a little bit about, uh, tell me a little bit about how this book came to be. Uh, uh, when I moved to Fort Bragg, I was rigged, I started uh, working in the woods along with Klein, uh, doing line clearance work. We, on the weekends and sometimes after work, I would go out with the crews and, and rig poultry for the loggers. It was lucrative and it was exciting. So being who I always am, uh, always was, and always will be, I had a camera with me all the time. And I took pictures of all the people I worked with and all the great trees that we climbed. And I started photographing the big trees I was working in uh, from day one. And uh, but I did not have a plan, I did not plan on doing a book about it. It was only until about 30 years later I realized that I had a collection of the last, a collection of photographs, contemporary uh, history of the last of the old growth logging in Mendocino County. Uh, Bill Bailey and his son, Nick Bailey, they... Is they, that Bailey's? Uh, Bailey's Incorporated. Mm -hmm. uh, they. Together, they felt that, that my collection of photographs should be published. And of course, I didn't have the money at the time, and it was always a lifelong dream after, you know, after, well, at post, you know, looking at all my archives of pictures, of I said, boy, I wish I could make a book out of this. Well, well, Bill Bailey and Nick Bailey uh, made it happen. They said, Jerry, we'll front the money for you to do that book. And I can't thank them enough. In the acknowledgments in this book, I give them a real hearty thanks because it couldn't have been done without them. And High Climbers is a contemporary history of the last of the old growth logging in Mendocino County. And it wouldn't have been possible without 30 years of photography in the woods and the help of the Baileys in and, making it work. And 30 years of Jerry asking people to hold still long enough to get a picture. <laughs> uh, the most difficult pictures in this book or, or in a chapter called The Cruise, where you get everybody on the crew together, standing together in a photograph. That is the most difficult thing to do in the woods. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to stop. It's all production work. And if, if they stop for a second and get together for a photograph, well, yeah. that's not getting any logs on the trucks. <laughs> yeah, but then later they all want the pictures. Of course. It's the same with video work. Uh, probably the most famous picture having to do with this industry is the Rockport tree. Tell, just, just give us a little bit of a background into that tree. That's uh, what led up to that job. I don't know what it was like to top a tree at seven feet in diameter, 150 feet up. Uh, that so <coughs> Rockport tree, like most of, most of the big trees in this book, were outlaws, and they would uh, they had is uh, there were the odd big trees that the old timers left, and we came back through. Why did they leave them? Because they had too much back lean over creeks, canyons. Uh, they uh, they were problematic on the stump. So they called them outlaw, like as a, a kind of a term of respect. 
like yeah, a well, problem tree. Oh yeah, they were uh, yeah they were too dangerous or, mm -hmm. or uh, impractical. They didn't have have lays. They could be perfectly good on the stump, beautiful tree. If you don't have the ground to fall them, uh, you'll bust the tree up. So they would leave it. So mm -hmm. here's these odd big trees out there, uh, scattered about in the second growth timber that we were picking up through the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And Rockport tree was one. And, and let's see, 1985, I think it was, I was working in Rockport clearing right away for the company. And the Rockport tree was right beside the right away. And we walked over to it one afternoon for lunch, during lunch and was looking up there at it. And it was marked to fall. Uh, this whole uh, hillside was uh, was marked as a select cut to fall, and the Rockport tree was one. And there was no ground for it. That's why it was left. And the only place to put it, if you could put it, this, uh, would be up the hill. And it was too tall to go up the hill uh, because it would cross Highway One. And I, the guys I was with, they said, well, what would somebody do with this? And I said, well, you really couldn't do anything with this tree unless you uh, talked it out. Uh, and then you could then you could work with the stub. You could put the top here or there, you know, and then put the stub up the hill and they would, uh, you know, there, that's one possibility. And we were sitting there looking up there and, the, and the thinking about how would you go about topping out a tree that's big? <laughs> Two years later, the the unit that was good, this, the tree, the Rockport tree stood on, was up for bid, and I knew the logger who got the job, and I called him up. It was Jerry Philbrook. I said, "Hey, Jerry, this is Jerry Gronick. I said, "I hear you got that uh, that unit uh, in Rockport with the big tree on it." And he says, "Yeah." I said, "What are you going to do with that tree?" And he says, "Well, we don't know yet." And I says, I'll tell you what, I can top that tree out and then you can do anything you want with it. And that's all I said. And he told me, he says, Jer, okay, Jer, it's yours. <laughs> and there, when I hung up the phone, I just, I just bit off a chunk that I really didn't think I was going to get, you know, but two years of thinking about that tree, when I hung up that phone, I says, I got that tree. And at the time, in all honesty, it was going to be the biggest tree I had ever worked in my life. Biggest cut I was ever going to make. Mm -hmm. Though, though and years high. later, years later, that, mm -hmm. that proved not true. Uh, but up to that that time, it it proved true. And anyway, word got around town that I was going to top out the Rockport tree, and I was getting a lot of uh, people were really excited. God, you're going to go up there, top that I tree up there. <laughs> and I go, yeah, well, you know, and he goes, oh, right. So I was getting did pats you, on the back. Did you lose any sleep? Uh, I, was, I was anxious, of course. Uh, okay. Uh, but Bob Hinkson was an old growth tree climber and bartender, owner of the Golden West Tavern. And uh, he worked for the Cal Barrel uh, Redwood Company in Northern California as a climber. And I had a very slight built uh, man. It is uh, near near 90 years old, and he, with all the excitement about this going on, I was sitting there having a beer in the Golden West, and, and Bob came up to me and leaned over the bar, and he stuck his finger in my face, and he says, you're going to die up there, Jer. Now, <laughs> I did not need Bob to tell me that. <laughs> you know, I needed... Maybe I, you did. Maybe it was, like, just <laughs> enough to get your... Uh, your uh, caution. A lot of people had told me I was just playing crazy. They wouldn't mm -hmm. tell me I was going to die. But with Bob's Bob's words rang in my ears. Well, even right. today. So you said, "I want to make sure not to die." Yeah. Thanks to this guy. So I was redundant. We went there uh, a month, two months before uh, that we even topped the tree, and I went up there and I I shifted the balance of the top. Uh, to the favor of the side that I wanted it to fall. So you delimbed one side of it? Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. did. And we also set, uh, that's when we set the springboards and mm -hmm. the chains and binders. In case it was rotten, um, I did, didn't want it uh, either mm -hmm. part uh, splitting out on me when we were in the middle mm -hmm. of cutting it. Uh, some people said that wouldn't, that wouldn't uh, work one bit. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, you know, 
it's better than not doing nothing. Yeah. And, uh, but I'll tell you what, I, 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 I know a little bit more about, uh, about those sort of things than people were telling me it would never work. Mm -hmm. I, I know stress loads and on rigging points and what will hold and what, what's right. marginal. It's amazing how, though, how a heckler can cause you to just second guess your plans for a minute, though. They can. Yeah. They can. And, and it, could throw, it could throw your concentration off, too. Yeah. But in the meantime, uh, while uh, we're doing this preparation work to get this top of the Rockport tree, uh, I had an accident on my regular job at work uh, and uh, broke my ankle. Yeah. Which <laughs> delayed things, sort of, uh, for a couple of months. Notice the cast in the, in the pictures on his foot. But while I was healing up, I got a call from a fellow in Manhattan, Kansas. His name is Charlie Potter. He's in the chapter there. Mm -hmm. He's the one that took the photographs of that talk going over. Cool. From Manhattan, Kansas, this guy yeah, calls me. Yeah, gnarly yeah, bearded is, looking yeah. old dude. Yeah, yeah. Sta Santa Claus on steroids, they call it. <laughs> Anyway, uh, he says, I just read an article in a magazine about some big trees you're working in. And uh, he says, are you working in, you got any big trees you're working in right now? And I says, well, as a matter of fact here, we got plants to top a tree. And I gave him all the, uh, all the details about the Rockport tree. And he says, don't do it until I get out there. Mm -hmm. So I can think, well, this is novel. The guy's going to come all the way out from Kansas to photograph me topping out wow. the rockboard tree. I'm telling is, you. This is great because yeah. he supposedly he knew how to run a camera, of course. Wow. So I go and well this is good. At least there's gonna be somebody there I'm about to get some decent shots of it. Mm -hmm. So okay the <clears throat> I healed up enough to uh, to do the job though the uh, I felt confident enough to do the job though I was still wearing a cast. The weather was improving. It was in it was in February. Uh, but we had a we had some good weather. Called Charlie up. I said, "Come on out. We're gonna let's talk the tree." So he came out here for a week with me. And uh, the morning we got up to go out to uh, do the tree, it started raining, started blowing. But it was intermittent. It was showers, and it was perfectly sunny there at times. So <laughs> we said, "Let's do it." They uh, the ground crew hoisted me up on a pass block, so mm -hmm. I didn't have to. Uh, but you had rigged it earlier. Yep, yeah, oh, everything mm. was rigged. Mm. All they had to do was haul my mm. my sack of potatoes up there, and mm -hmm. so I could stand on that platform oh, and run yeah. the saw. The homework paid off. Mm -hmm. Charlie's in the in the redwood uphill from us, kind of looking down at the action. It was a spot that I had picked before uh, when we were setting the springboards, uh, and so he was in the same vantage point to take the pictures. And before I put the back cut in there, start the back cut in that tree, I asked him if he was ready. You know, I said, this, he says, I don't know how fast this is going to go, uh, but I said, don't shoot all the pictures up all at once. Uh, yeah, I said, you make sure you, you get it when it's going over. Said, don't get too excited. That's just you burn it. Because all I had was a roll of uh, 36 exposure right. film in there. Only 36 shots, you know, chances to capture this. Mm -hmm. And he says, geez, I've already taken 30 pictures, Jer. And I says, well, then don't shoot any more until it starts going over. And I says, when it really starts going over. Man. And he says, okay, okay. And he says, by the way, Jerry, he says, from here, it looks like that top is leaning right over me. And I said, Charlie, that's just an optical illusion. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Stay there with the camera. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there was a, a moment when, when that top left the snipe, it was completely silent. And then you could hear the, the wind building through the top as it built up speed. And then the tops of the second growth tree, which were all 150 to 170 foot tall out there in front of us, were, were all falling down. Ooh, I'd like and to this that. roar of, like the crack of thunder overhead filled the canyon. I want my GoPro on that top. I want to. Yeah. I tried to get out on the front of the springboards to watch it go over, but it, that stub was rocking far too hard. I had to hang on to the rope and the saw to, to keep from getting mm -hmm. bucked off. It was right. you know, otherwise I was going to get right out in the front and watch it go down. 
but, yeah. but I couldn't do it. When it was over, it was like taking the weight of the world off me. Off oh, my yeah. Shoulders. Yeah, imagine. I feel relieved. <laughs> I feel relieved now, and it's... Uh, uh, oh, there was a roar of excitement, too, following later. that. There was, there was probably 50 people from Fort Bragg when it was up on the highway to watch that thing go. So it, it was a pretty exciting moment. Wow. Bob, Bob Hankson's prophecy did not, was not fulfilled. No. Is Bob around still? <laughs> uh, he died about 10 years ago. Uh, I see. Well, um, do you guys want to take a break? Yeah. For a right. second. We're going okay. to take a short break.